Queensland Rail lines are closed. There will be no trains today. Where's the train? Why is it late? All Queensland Rail lines are closed. There will be no trains today. I can't hear the public announcement. I don't know what's being said. Perhaps there's important information there that I'm missing out on. Emergency information, evacuation, information about possible floods, all of it relies on spoken English or public audio announcements, information that I can't access. This was the catalyst behind this project, to make information accessible for deaf people in Auslan. Historically, accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing people has focused on cochlear implants and hearing aids. In public places, you might see this sign, which says there's a hearing induction loop. That cuts down on interference for cochlear implant and hearing aid users. But for a deaf person whose first language is a sign language, that's less useful than just having visual information. In a perfect world, all information should be available in every language, including the local sign language. But we do recognize there might be some hurdles to that. The first hurdle is that Auslan, the sign language of the Australian deaf community, is not widely known outside of the deaf community. Historically, a hearing person tended to only learn Auslan if they actually knew a deaf person, but that is changing. Auslan is currently available as a language other than English in the Australian curriculum, so we're seeing more kids learning it at school. We also saw a doubling of demand for adult Auslan classes in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, probably inspired by all the interpreters you were seeing on your screens. So this is our first hurdle. If you're a hearing person with a message that you need translated into Auslan, you need it translated into Auslan. This brings us to our second hurdle. Australia is currently experiencing a critical shortage of certified Auslan interpreters. Auslan interpreting is both highly skilled and highly in demand. So you'd think there would be a lot of people lining up to become Auslan interpreters. However, working in this industry is also quite precarious. Every engagement of an Auslan interpreter tends to be short term. You'll engage an interpreter for a couple of hours, usually oneself, maybe for a couple of weeks in a row. This precarity is a barrier to recruiting more Auslan interpreters. Okay, so that's hurdle one and two. The third hurdle is something very practical. You need to have screens. Being a very visible language, you need to be able to see Auslan content. And not every public place is equipped with the right kinds of screens. Now, this problem with content not being available in Auslan is not just about public announcements. With the rise of voice-activated technologies, such as the Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, and Apple Siri, we are seeing technologies that are completely inaccessible to deaf people. And so that's why we're doing this project, to ensure that this technology can become more accessible for deaf people. We interviewed over 14 different people, deaf people, and they provided a variety of responses. The demographics of this cohort was from ages 16 to, to over 40, and so everybody used different types of signing styles and had different ways of working. And so when I asked them the question about if you would like a device accessible in Auslan, a resounding result from most of them was yes. It was their dream, something that they would want is to have that same equality when it comes to accessibility and technology. You can see here from the pie graph in yellow, the response was that yes, they would like it to happen in future, but not sure that it could happen. It was important for us and for those people that I interviewed to make sure that we can be independent, that we don't have to rely on asking other people for information and to know what's happening. We want to be empowered to be able to be independent. And by having this device um, or information delivered in Auslan, it means that it is accessible for deaf people. We have found that when deaf people do try to use these technologies, even if they are fluent English speakers, 
there is a gap between what the devices are able to recognize and the way deaf people speak. In our project, the Auslan Communication Technologies Pipeline Project, we're seeking to create that Auslan in, Auslan out device in the model of one of these personal assistants. The idea is that a deaf person should be able to interact with it in the same way that a hearing person can interact with their personal assistants. So this means that they should be able to start by getting the device's attention. Paralleling the Hey Alexa phase of your English speaking personal assistant for an Auslan signing device that probably looks like a wave and a unique name sign. The device then needs to let the user know that it's ready to receive their command. In an English speaking device, that happens with a ding. For an Auslan signing device, it needs to have a body. We've chosen an avatar for our device's body. This is because it gives us a lot of flexibility and control. We can control what the device signs and how it signs it, and we can control the avatar's appearance. We can change things like clothing and background color, but also things like age, race, and gender, things that the end user of these devices might like to be able to customize so that the avatar feels like a better fit in their home and with their family. Okay, so you've gotten the device's attention. You then get to sign your command. Much like the English speaking smart assistants, we want the deaf person to be able to sign naturally and comfortably. Unlike your English speaking voice assistants, we're not using audio input. We're going to have to use video input so that we can see the person signing. It then needs to be processed using artificial intelligence. So unlike an audio assistant, we're not working on an audio stream, we're working on a video stream, which you can imagine as being split up into a number of still images. What our device needs to do is look at those still images and figure out where does one sign end and the next sign begin. That lets us split up the video. We can then take each bundle of frames to figure out what sign has been made within them. We then need to take all of the frames that we've just processed, all of the signs we've just recognized, and figure out what is the whole command that has been signed. Well, we might be able to cheat with that last part. We know some of the early English speaking devices didn't actually understand a full sentence. They really just looked for key words like lights and kitchen. We might be able to get away with the same thing in this first prototype. Okay, you've signed your command. The device has processed it, the AI has understood it. It then needs to act on the command, do whatever it is you've told it to do, and sign back. Either a confirmation, yes, I've done that, or some more information, giving you an update on whatever it is it's just done. In order to do that, our device has a small library of signs that we've pre-recorded using motion capture. So our avatar signs following Julie's movements. So you can see on the slide behind me, on the left, you can see that I have the full motion capture suit on. I've got my gloves on, which are quite thick. I've got the headband as well. And so this motion capture suit allows my movements to be captured um, and processed into the system. So what is the weather like for tomorrow um, as a command, I would sign. There were quite a few challenges as part of this process. When I was fingerspelling words on my hands, because of the gloves being quite thick, it meant that my natural fluid motions that I'm very familiar with ended up being quite staccato. And so on the computer, it also meant that my hands were further apart. There was an amazing animator, um, designer, Maria, who ended up doing some of those edits for me on the computer to make sure that the appropriate location was used for those signs. So just to give an example, this is a sign for why, it's a sign on your chest. And when it came up on the computer, it actually ended up being on the incorrect side of my chest. So we needed to make sure that all of those signs were captured appropriately because all of that is part of the language. And it would also mean that when that information is signed to that device, that it can also be understood. 
You can see the other um, picture there up on the slide. Was better. Um, the gloves were still a challenge, but over time, we're definitely going to see some improvements there, and it was a learning curve for me um, to make sure that I could try and improve on how I signed those different things as well using that motion capture. Going into this project, we had a vague idea of what our end result would look like because we can compare what we're doing to what English-speaking devices look like. But it's still a new device for a new audience. So we wanted to take a design approach that involves our end users throughout the design process to make sure we really understand their needs, expectations, and abilities when it comes to interacting with these technologies and making sure that the technologies we create will be useful and actually get used by the community. These design approaches are called participatory design, or sometimes co-design, because your end users participate throughout the design process. Clever name. In an AI-heavy project like this one, it was particularly important that we have a participatory design approach to our data collection. Because we need to train a machine learning Auslan recognizer, we need lots and lots and lots of videos of native Auslan signers signing the commands so that we can train our computer system to be able to recognize those signs. These videos cannot be de-identified because in Auslan, it's not just about the hands and the movement, but also facial expressions that can influence the meaning of a particular sign. From a research perspective, being able to publish AI data sets is useful because it does encourage other researchers to work on similar problems and potentially could result in having better technologies for the Australian deaf community. But not everyone in our deaf advisory panel was going to feel comfortable having completely identifiable videos of them floating around the internet. And that was something that we wanted to make sure we understood and respected. Working with our deaf advisory panel has been about more than just collecting data for training the AI systems. We have learned a lot from them about the technical requirements for this kind of device, but also about the linguistic and cultural concerns that it will need to address to be truly useful to the Australian deaf community. Talking about those linguistics and cultural concerns, it was quite important as part of this project. Auslan is its own language. It has its own grammar and structure, things that needed to be included, like facial expressions um, or location, all of that information being captured into the um, AI device, the computer. So talking about signs as well and the different vocabulary, there are some variations throughout Australia through different dialects. So Queensland and New South Wales have similar dialects. We call it the Northern dialect. But Southern Australia, Melbourne, South Australia, and so forth um, actually is a Southern dialect. And then when you come to Western Australia, they also have their own dialect. Having said that, there are commonalities um, and common signs throughout Australia. But to give you an example, this is a sign for car in Queensland. If you imagine the wheel and your hands are on that wheel driving. But in Victoria, the sign that they use for car is this. <laughs> so that in itself actually means coffee in Queensland. So there are those different dialects. And so we needed to think about those considerations if we, do involve, um, if we include all those different dialects within the system or if we have to make a decision to remove some of those or not include it for now. And so we need to think about, well, how often is that signed? And if it is quite often, then trying to include it. So it was quite an extensive process there. Another concern through the um, process was also about hand shapes. The hand shapes are different when it comes to um, Auslan. The grammar, as I mentioned, is also different. So another thing that I want to talk about when it comes to the language is about formal and informal use of the language. So when we're signing every day, we are quite fluent. And whether or not a device would understand me if I was being so fluid and fast, um, the question there was if they would be able to understand me or if I need to adjust my signing to be very clear in how I articulate that. So it does mean having to change 
how I sign to a device, which is similar to how you would use a personal assistive device anyway in voice recognition. If it doesn't understand you because you've spoken too quickly to it, it'll ask you to repeat it. So that'll be the similar case with Auslan we found. We needed to think about how we signed it, and if it wasn't understood, think about how that command could be clearly signed um, in a way for that device to understand it. So when it came to Auslan, it is difficult, um, but we are also conscious that we want to be able to access that device in Auslan because not all deaf people are able to speak. There are a lot of advantages to having a personal assistant that is fluent in Auslan. But there are also a lot of challenges that would need to be solved before this could become a commercial device. Let's use the bedroom as an example. The bedroom is a really handy place to have a personal assistant. But if your personal assistant has a camera because it needs to see you signing, it could also see you naked or engaged in intimate activities. <laughs> and members of our deaf advisory panel have rightly told us that that would be a problem. So we would have to figure out what does the device see? And once it's captured video data, what happens to that? Where does it get saved, processed, sent? And can anyone see it? There's other sensitive information that these types of devices can have. Credit cards, for example. It can be really handy for your device to know your credit card, so you can give a command like, order the groceries. But just because the device knows your credit card details doesn't mean you want other people to be able to order the groceries or other things. So there would need to be security to make sure that kids or visitors can't access that information and make big purchases. OK, so we are in the third year of a three-year project. By the end of our project, we expect to have a prototype which can recognize a subset of Auslan signs based on what our deaf advisory panel have told us is most useful to them. It should also be able to respond with a subset of pre-recorded, sensible responses. So for example, if someone signs, call mum, the device should recognize those signs, find mum in its internal phone book, launch a video call, and sign back, calling mum now. This is obviously not the end of the road. To get a Auslan-capable device that is as good as the current English-speaking devices probably is going to need more than a three-year project something more like a 10-year project. But we do know, even at the end of the 10 years, we will probably not have a device that can solve the interpreter shortage. Being able to interpret between Auslan and English is, as I said, a highly skilled job. It involves not just changing between languages, but changing between language modalities and understanding the language needs of everyone involved in a conversation and meeting them. But just because a device is not perfect doesn't mean it's useless. If you think about the components of the device, well, something that can recognize even a few Auslan signs could be useful by itself as a tool for Auslan learners to practice with. Something that can take some English words and translate it into signs, well, that could be useful to make, say, parts of the internet more accessible to deaf people. And if you have a device in your home your office, or your pocket, which understands Auslan, that could help to make life a little bit easier and a little bit more accessible for Australia's deaf community. Hey, why is the train late? Yes, please. Thank you. That'll be an enormous help. <laughs> <laughs>